Hey everybody, welcome to Do You Believe on Paranormal Zone TV. Hey, so nice to see everybody tonight. And welcome back to my main channel, Paranormal Zone TV. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. We got a great show tonight. And please don't forget, if you're new to the show, if you would please subscribe, I'd really appreciate it. But tonight, my guest is Jason Haxton. Jason Ross Haxton, I'm so excited to have him back. I interviewed Jason like seven years ago, and we actually <laughs> did, had, Jason doesn't, I don't know if you remember Jason, but we did, we did several shows. Um, and, and I was so excited to have Jason back to get an update. Now, Jason is the author of The Dibbit Box. He is also, oh, wait a minute, not yet, uh, not yet. He is the also, also the author of, um, uh, let's see, The Dibbit Box. And um, he was the owner of the third, he's the third owner of The Real Dibbit Box. And that Dibbit Box now, as in the hands of Zach Bagan's Haunted Museum. And I want to, we're going to talk about that tonight. But I also want um, Jason to talk about all the experiences, tell the viewers all the experience he's had with this Dibbit Box and the history of the Dibbit Box. So welcome to the show, Jason. Well, thanks, Noreen. Yeah, it's been too long. I was beginning to wonder if you uh, were mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're such a serious researcher. You know some of the greatest paranormal um, uh, celebrities and people that, that know their craft. And so it's an honor to be back with you after a little bit of a reprieve. And yeah, we'll give people a lot of information. There is a lot of question. You know how the internet is. Well, do you have it? Don't you have it? Does Zach have it? Does someone else have it? What's going on? Right. So we'll give you all that information tonight. Awesome, Jason. Now, before we start the show, Jason, would you please tell the viewers about yourself? Right. So um, I'm just a normal guy, like a lot of uh, you out there in the viewing audience. Um, I don't think paranormal was uh, much of a, a word in my vocabulary um, until uh, working at a medical museum. And certainly we deal with human remains and what might look like, um, you know, instruments of torture, you know, medicine of yesteryear. Um, I was minding my own business and uh, we'd hired a college student to do a little extra work for us and he brings up in 2004 that his roommate had bought a haunted Jewish wine box. And this is like, I had no idea what, what did this mean? He of course showed us uh, an image. I thought, well, that's a rather, you know, cute looking little box. But as we read the story that's behind the box, how the people who had bought it had horrible misfortunes and paranormal activity with it, um, I certainly was cautious. And uh, though I wanted to see this thing, I didn't necessarily want it in my life, but we don't always get what we want. <laughs> and so that's kind of how I tied into the Divic Box. I'm not really a, a, a paranormal person in general, but with this object, my fascination and pretty much my feel threatened by it caused me to do nine years of research, learning um, the Jewish language, uh, basically Hebrew, um, studying everything that relates to uh, mysticism and what this thing could be. No rabbi has ever doubted that the Dibbit box is of Jewish origin. And um, me just being a simple Methodist boy, I often asked uh, the rabbis, I said, now why did I get this thing? Because, um, you know, you're the ones that understand the faith. He goes, well, you being an outsider, you would question everything. We're so comfortable, we might overlook details of this unique artifact. And so that's kind of um, helped comfort me uh, in my journey of, of, of research and understanding um, this artifact. Mm -hmm. You are the uh, third owner of this Dibbit box. Now, I will, just to let everybody know, the Jason was has been featured on several TV shows, the History Channel, the Travel Channel, the Discovery Channel, and also on the movie, um, the DVD, the movie, The Possession, there's a special feature with Jason in it. Now, Jason, how did you get involved with the movie, The Possession? Well, you know, that's an interesting thing. You know, Hollywood, you're out in California. Hollywood is a whole nother, you know, world, and um, certainly not a world that... Um, a Midwestern guy like me really wants to be part of. But uh, Mr. Raimi, Sam Raimi, who is noted for his horror, of course, Evil Dead, Army of Darkness, he kind of teethed on these American horror films. He grew that into Grudge, which um, drew on Asian horror. 
when he caught wind through an article um, that was in the LA Times that there was an artifact of, of Jewish superstition and um, of, of paranormal activity, he wanted to have a part of it. So, of course, I was contacted. It's like, you know, I really appreciate you contacting me, but this is really a personal project. Um, and so thanks, but no thanks. And um, he would not he he would not relent and uh, basically said that um, you, you really do want to tell the story and I'm the best person to tell it and protect you from others that might want to misuse this information. So it was a compelling story. And uh, I said, but you know, again, I don't need the money, don't really need um, the, the popularity that comes with this. And um, he said, well, you can do what you want with the money. So the cool thing about the Divic Box is, um, and the movie The Possession, it's allowed me to use those royalties um, and actually help orphans in Vietnam. Uh, Vitho is a Catholic orphanage. We take doctors there. We do a lot of cool stuff. So you have to kind of, when you're with Paranormal, watch that karma. You know, if you take for yourself, you you may be in for a tough ride. I think if you give and you go in the most supportive method, then I think you're on good ground uh, in the spiritual world. So that's kind of a little bit how Mr. Ramey got involved with it. And just so you know, you're correct on all those various documentaries. I think the best one was on sci-fi, um, Paranormal Witness. Um, and we'll talk about the one I did with Zach. Uh, basically uh, Deadly Possessions, which is how Zach kind of got into the position. We can talk about that. But just this week, I was working with Entertainment Magazine, uh, Cable Channel. So they are actually uh, doing a behind-the-scenes of movies, all movies, but they're particularly curious about the possession. So in a couple months, expect to see yet another Divic Bach uh, documentary um, from uh, Entertainment Cable. Mm, interesting. Now, okay, so let's go back. Um, the, f the first owner of the box, this famous box, is Dev um, Kevin Manis. Correct, except for the family that created it, which was Havala. Um, Kevin receives it at a yard sale, um, which you can see in the outline of the movie. There is, uh, again, based on, on truth, the possession will give you a lot of clues as to what really happened. So Kevin's minding his own business. He's got a little antique shop. He does a little designing. He sees this interesting little wooden box with grape applique. It's got an interesting feature that if you pull the bottom drawer, the front doors open. And within it are all these strange, um, kind of familiar pieces of hair and and octopus candlesticks and, and brass cups and um, flowers and, and granites with uh, Hebrew lettering on it. So he's somewhat kind of intrigued by this thing, um, decides to pull everything out of it and give it to his mother as um, a birthday gift. Only when she touches it, all of life goes bad. And after a number of negative things going on, Kevin decides the best thing to do is to get rid of this. And so he um, he feels that when he bought it from the family, there was a kind of a cash deal that you must willingly buy the box. And he paid a small amount for it. So now he feels that to pass it on, someone has to know the story and willingly buy it. And in comes a college student curious about the paranormal, uh, Yosef. He buys the box. His life turns upside down. Um, he's a roommate of uh, the young man that works at my museum, and I find out about it. Um, I'm not really thinking I want to buy this thing. I just want to look at it. But he is so sure that you buy the deal that no one can see it unless they buy it, regardless of whether it's a buck or, you know, you know $100. It, it's just the idea of buying a curse. And so I'm really hesitant to get involved with this thing. Do you believe that the box is cursed? I believe it has a really strong energy, and I think the curse aspect is how you approach it. Again, if you approach it with openness and acceptance, I think it, it is um, an interesting spiritual journey. I think if you approach it with fear, it will basically feed on that and create an even more dangerous um, situation for those. So even now, as people can see it, I'm constantly reading about negative effects it has on people who go and visit it um, at the Haunted Museum. And again, we'll tell a little bit more about that. 
So I actually end up getting the Divic box, not for myself, but a friend who wants to create an illusion of a spirit. And I tell him there's this thing called the Divic box that has a spirit attached. He goes, well, can we buy it? I said, well, the weird thing is you can, but why would you want to? What if it's got this attachment? He goes, well, all the better. I said, well, why don't we just make a, a, a knockoff, a pretend? Um, he goes, well, that's not good enough if we can get the real thing. So he convinces me to buy the Divic box because he's willing to take it off my hands if things go wrong. However, very quickly things go wrong and he wants nothing to do with it. And that's what sets me on the goal of what is this thing and how do we work with it? And you you actually wanted this box though because you, you were intrigued by it and you wanted to study it and research it. So on your research, what did you find out about this box? Well, and that's the uh, interesting thing. Um, you know, with these various tokens and things to kind of attract spirits or demons, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, in the spiritual world, you cannot really have physical possession. So the best way to trap something into a physical object is to willingly offer physical items. And it's kind of like the spirit traps itself. It wants to own something it can't have. And so it kind of hangs around and stays with its stuff. And so you kind of fool it into um, coming into a physical world. And then like any addiction, it doesn't want to leave its stuff. And I think that's how the Divic Box kind of initially worked, was these things were meant to attract a spiritual entity. entity, And now it wants to just nestle with it. And in the process, gives access to people um, into the spiritual world. So... The woman that creates this box initially is trying to get information um, from the spiritual world, from God, and um, she she prays to it, she talks to it. Um, She's very focused on the Holocaust, and Mm -hmm. she wants to understand how that began. Now, most of us would say, well, that's Hitler, that's any idiot could figure that one out. But the interesting thing about the Divic box is she's saying, no, there's something smaller and and more uh, sublime about the Divic box and I want it to unearth a secret about the Holocaust and of course she dies and her ruling is I don't think the woman ever wanted this thing to be out in the public she requests that it be buried with her however when the family goes to the rabbi and says you know grandma's passed she would like this little box buried with her The rabbi's like, what's this? We don't bury things with our dead. There's no use. That's what the Egyptians do. We were the Egyptian slave. This does us no good. I am not burying this little box with her. Give it away. Make it useful for something. But we will not do this. And so the family, with not knowing what to do with grandma's creepy little box that she talked to and prayed to every day for 40 years, they basically, you know, putting all this energy into it, um, daily they just stuck it in a yard sale and um, they kind of thought that whoever bought it would set it into motion to tell a story uh, about the holocaust but in the meantime anyone who comes across the divic box and makes their own wish has the opportunity to get that also so as it was created with this spirit to answer the woman's prayer about the holocaust other people, authors, Sam Raimi, um, Amish, all kinds of people have become aware of the Divic Box and each have asked of it something. And it's granted every one of them what we consider almost miraculous results. Well, then how could it be cursed if they're getting a wish and it comes true? Well, the people who wish for themselves usually, you know, it's kind of like the monkey paw. Don't go wishing for things. You might get what you want. So I guess I should say that if it's done with um, not good intent, you will get your wish, but you might get it in a bad way. I've only once um, asked the Divic Box for something that I thought was my rightful, um, um, just my rights Mm -hmm. uh, 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 that I should have, and um, it reacted immediately and gave me what I wanted. But I think at a cost... Uh, possibly to someone else's life, and it's not worth that. Uh, Everyone else that I've ever worked with the Divic Box has been to help uh, maybe an Amish child with a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. Remove half the brain, the child is not even, um, um, he doesn't lose
lose his memory, doesn't lose his physical ability, and uh, becomes a savant singer, uh, like an angel. Uh, a journalist, a Jewish gal, thought that Dibbuk Box could make her fame. And so she writes the article, that's how Sam Raimi sees it in the LA Times. And now she can do whatever she wants. She has her own show, she has her own um, um, uh, articles and books. So all I'm saying is each person, Raimi, he wanted a, a, a successful Jewish horror, and it was a number one hit. A week before, a similar movie came out and never even made money, uh, lost almost, um, I don't know, $7 million. And I'm thinking, this is going to go down really bad. And yet, there is something about this artifact. It just will not go away. It just keeps growing. Um, and so it's fascinating. And our our viewing and uh, listening audience actually could have access to see it if they wanted. And it's one of the reasons that I got rid of the Dybbuk boxes. In my possession, I don't want to be bothered by people. I keep it buried. It draws out the energy. It's, you know, people kept begging. And, and why do you do this? Why don't you let other people see it? It's like, because this isn't my life. And then I found a person who this is their life and promised me that they would give everyone access and that's Zach Piggins. Okay, so we have a question. What, sure. um, Jason, exp oh, wait a minute, hold on, I lost it. Hold on. Oh, gosh, hold on. Okay, um, we have a question uh, from Cassandra. She's our mod, one of our mods. Uh, could you please have Jason explain what a Dybbuk is and what the box was for? Okay, that's a good question. So in um, Jewish mysticism, a Dybbuk is the soul of a person that has died abruptly without finishing. They have unfinished business and their spirit can find no peace in the afterlife unless they come back and try to undo or resolve their issue. Um, an example might be um, a Dybbuk might have been uh, abusive and harmful to its children. So its goal is to come back into another person. So you're kind of sharing your spirit and your body with this outsider spirit, and it then manipulates you to resolve its issue. Once that's resolved, it's at peace, it goes away, and it's over. So this is what um, a cleaving, an attaching spirit is um, from the Divic. And they've, they've been talked about in Jewish mysticism since at least about 1500 AD. So there's a long history of this spirit that has not moved on. Um, and um, so um, that gives you a little idea about the Divic. The purpose of this box was to answer the Holocaust. And in a nutshell, we all know that Hitler instigated laws, they're called the Nuremberg Laws, Jewish uh, immigration restriction, sterilization, um, uh, marriage restriction. All these laws in the 1930s did great harm um, to Jewish and other populations in Europe. But what the Dybbuk box discovered by coming to Kirksville because we don't even have a synagogue. If we have a few Jewish people, it's very minimal. So when the Divic box is supposed to answer some great Holocaust mystery, I basically had to say, you know what? That spirit has made a huge mistake. There is nothing in the middle of the United States that has anything to do with the Holocaust. But here's where the trick is. Actually, a professor of breeding animals, chickens, pigs, horses, he is actually... Um, killing off 10% because those are the mutants. Those are the, the, the bad stock if you want a pure and good animal breeding. He takes this information, sends it to the eugenics movement in Cold Spring Harbor, New York. Charles Davenport, the head of the seas, this brilliant young man, brings him to Cold Spring Harbor, New York, and he rewrites laws in the United States for sterilizing humans, for immigration restriction of Jews to the United States in the 1920s, marriage restriction, all of these laws, basically when Hitler comes into power, he looks to the United States, says that's what we need to do, he takes them verbatim, and they become the Nuremberg Laws. 
the dark secret is, and all you have to do is look up the word Laughlin, because this guy's name was Harry Laughlin, mm -hmm. L-U-G-H-L-I-N. Harry Laughlin, just type in Google Laughlin Hitler, and this whole story of the Midwest and America's involvement with what happened in Germany um, is a dark secret that most people don't know. So the Dybbuk box was to answer the prayer and point out this tiny little development that had huge ramifications. So that's one prayer answered, but systematically the Dybbuk box continues to answer prayers. And I guess if you went to um, the Haunted Museum and saw it, and you actually wanted to ask the Dybbuk box for something, I would recommend ask for someone else and not yourself. You may be surprised how that energy would resolve and give you what you want. Wow. It doesn't question. You, you know, when I talked with you um, seven years ago, we had talked about what was happening with you at that time. Oh, yeah. And I, re, I have this picture of you. Your, what, what, tell the viewers what happened. Your eyes were all red. What right, happened? They, um, they were bleeding. Um, one of the things, supposedly, that when a divic enters the body, one of the aspects is it can enter through the eyes and it causes damage. And so what's interesting is the bloodshot eyes, the choking, uh, this disorientation, these flashes of light, shadowy figures, all of these things that were happening to me, I'm not one to believe in the spiritual aspect. I believe that I actually touched this thing and someone contaminated it with arsenic or some kind of chemical and that I was basically touching and putting um, this substance in me. But when we tested the box, there was nothing but sugar water. Sugar is actually one of the best varnishes. Um, it's hard. It doesn't decompose. It lasts forever. And when you're done, you can wipe it off and put more on. So I was really quite scared. But this is what the Dybbuk was doing to push you forward to unravel and solve the mystery. Everybody at the Dybbuk box went through similar symptoms and, and their life was a mess. As soon as they got rid of the Dybbuk box, their life returned back to normal. And so I wasn't about to get rid of it until I figured it out for fear that I would lose control. And as I uncovered this mystery um, about these American laws that were transported to Germany, the box then calmed. It, it had answered the old woman's prayer, and I was somewhat at peace with it. So that is why... Um, um, to some degree, I kept it in because I thought, well, what if people make the wrong prayers to it and start it all up again into other dimensions, other um, issues? Um, so they were very realistic and scary symptoms, but they all resolved once um, the mystery was challenged. And I do think, again, each person, the box was pushing you to answer the old woman's prayer. Interesting. Now, also... I remember you telling me how your aging process and your health reversed. Tell them about it, that. That is really pretty fact because during the time of having it, I went very gray. Um, my, my health seems to suffer really badly. Um, what's interesting is once the, the box was resolved, there did seem uh, to be kind of like, because uh, this was 2004, so by 2006, there actually seemed to be kind of like a benefit of having the box around and, um, you know, uh, being in the best shape I'd ever been in, in, in years. Um, and I still feel that today, um, though I'm now 61, I certainly feel, uh, as I was when I was in my thirties, um, lifting weights, walking, um, you know, no health issues, except when someone coughs on you for like an entire trip. <laughs> <laughs> so if I sound a little a little scratchy, it's because I went to Brazil uh, to do some lectures and I literally had someone cough on me next to me and there was not another seat in the plane. And um, so I'm kind of over it now. But what I'm saying is for the most part, I actually do feel healthier than I've, I've been and um, certainly don't feel my age. And so I do think that's kind of a benefit. And in many ways, those um, changes have never reversed back, which I think is kind of exciting. Oh, lucky you. I think I better, I go, I better go visit that box when we go to Vegas in October. Um, Gain 20, 20 to 
20 years of your youth back uh, the Divic Box is the fountain of youth. <laughs> hey, now, 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 with Kevin Manis, the first, the well, like you said, the, the, they had he's like the second owner, I guess. What you say, I guess there's the creator, yeah. but the, then there's the actual but didn't he or... name that box? Didn't Kevin name that box the Divic Box? It truly is. You know, when people say that there are other Divic Boxes, there really is only the one. It, it is not something in Jewish um, culture. Divics are, but the Divic box, a chest that holds a, a, a cleaving spirit, that is the only one. And as a matter of fact, Kevin actually said that that's what the family, the 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 Havila, the hundred and three year old lady. I mean, she lived ancient. She got pneumonia and died in days. But up to that point, she was in perfect health and very mystic. And she is the one who told her family it's a Divic box and not to touch it, not to bother it, and bury it with me when I'm gone. So he really picked up the name from the family. But except for this old lady calling it that, there is really no such thing as a Dybbuk box except this one. And did she call it that just to, you know, basically tell the family, stand out of my stuff? <laughs> don't go messing with my, my, my stuff. Yeah. You know? So it's kind of like when you say, you know, if you don't go to bed, there's a boogeyman out the window. He's going to get you. Now, yeah. is there a boogeyman? No. Is there really a divot box? We don't know. But she basically was saying, don't touch my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, now, you, well, you know, there's a lot of people out there claiming to have, oh, I have a divot box and it's haunted. Um, you know, the, the other th uh, thing is with Kevin Manis. Now, he didn't have such good luck. He Things didn't work out so well for him. No, they, they really didn't. Um, yet, here's the weird thing. I mean, his mother suffered a stroke, and, and a, a variety of things went wrong. However, once the Dybbuk box kind of was resolved, his mother's health regained. She lived, uh, you know, multiple um, years, decades longer, even after the severe um, kind of injury from touching the box. And she's the one who said that when I touched it, an energy came out of it. She goes, it was like a volcano. She goes, we live near Mount St. Helens. And when that thing blows, you don't know where to run, where to hide. She goes, that is exactly what came out of the box, that kind of an energy. And she never liked it to her dying day. She never wanted anything to do with that box, uh, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, but Kevin, I think things have kind of turned around slowly for Kevin. Again, I think as he's kind of accepted it, and in many ways, uh, he said, you know, my path wasn't the one I would have necessarily picked, but I think um, there's more spiritual understanding, and that's true of me also. I, 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 I appreciate what I gained, not necessarily the way I had to gain it, but it, I think it, it is um, tends to make people more spiritual. The only person that I think suffers the most and still um, is not over it was the college student, uh, Yosef, who bought it. I, I still, to this day, he wants nothing to do with it. He wants it nowhere in his life. Um, and I think it's truly scared him. And so um, I, I kind of regret that he's not been able to move on um, from this artifact. Um, did you ever bring in a rabbi or a shaman? Um, many rabbis um, have actually witnessed and seen the Dybbuk box, and um, none of them doubt that it was created from a Jewish perspective. Um, they also say there's no accident, that this thing, um, you know, it's creation. Uh, we might not understand it, but there is a logic, there is, there is um, um, uh, a need. Um, this thing um, is what it is supposed to be. You know, um, for, for a, a guy like me to go out there and, and identify a box like this, I didn't realize how precarious I was putting myself out there because the rabbis, um, you know, it's their religion, it's their world, and the last thing they want is somebody like me putting anything out there. And yet, um, no, they say there's no mistake. And this mystery of the Holocaust being an American set of laws transported to Germany. Germans don't know it. Jews don't know it. This is not common knowledge, but it fascinates them how things uh, came and resolved themselves. And so they say, you know, we may not understand it, but we don't doubt it. Mm. Um, how long did you own the Dibbit box? How, how um, I first heard of it in 2003. By 2004, it was in my possession. Um, 
right away Mr. Raimi wanted to make it into a movie. It took him almost seven years. He had script after script after script written, and they never were good enough. He said the research and the story is stronger than the writers, and I'm not going to do this until it's absolutely correct. The amount of money that he spent waiting for the story, and in the end, he said it's good enough. It's not what I want, but uh, uh, Juliet Snowden and Styles White wrote um, the, the screenplay. He says, I'm going to have to settle. It may never be what I want it to be, but that's it. Now, there's actually a second script, but I find it fascinating. It's almost like they can't make themselves reproduce the movie. Um, really? And that doesn't matter to me. In the meantime, all these other shows, it actually came out um, in um, India that they reconnected to their Jewish culture. I mean, you think of India, millions and millions of people everywhere. But during Marco Polo's um, Silk uh, uh, Road, some of the Jews who were doing, um, basically selling and buying, peeled off and went into India. And India has its own unique Jewish uh, history and culture. And when they found out about the Divic box, they relearned about their own Jewish background. And there actually is a, a movie in India called Ezra, which is a, a Jewish family name, Dibbik. Now, oh. you know, in India, everything's Bollywood. You know, oh, yeah. boy meets girl, <laughs> yeah. boy finds girl, boy marries girl, and everybody dances. Yeah. You know, even in Slumdog Millionaire, you know, boy gets girl, you know, <laughs> boy gets, everything's the way it is. So when this guy said, I want to write a new movie for India, and the old directors and producers said, so boy meets girl, he goes, no, boy doesn't meet girl. Everybody dies. <gasps> <laughs> and, they're, and they're like, everybody dies. Um, uh, 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 the, the big dance scene. Because there's no big dancing. Everybody dies. Oh, my God. <laughs> and the directors are like, what kind of movie do you want to create? Nobody will go to this movie. This is trash. He does the movie, number one movie in India. Nothing like it ever. So the funny thing is, it doesn't matter the language, the culture. The Divic Box draws people to it and always draws success in telling its story. So I thought that was right. So sometime you guys might want to watch Ezra Divic, uh, the the Indian story of the Divic box. All right. Now, also, you had some things happening around your house about what happened with the tree falling on the house. Well, that was one of the, you know, before I even owned the Divic box, which should have been a cautionary tale not to get involved, was um, after the Divic box arrived um, to this uh, museum workers um, apartment we were making fun all the time it's like oh you know something we trip or stub our toe or something would go wrong and we'd blame the Divic it's like oh my gosh it's the Divic and he was really getting kind of tired of the jokes and um, the interesting thing was the day the Divic box actually arrived in the mail see Kevin wanted rid of it he, he immediately boxes it sends it it floats around for a month nobody knows where so long that the students who bought it forgot they bought it. And then one day it magically shows up. No explanation where it's been. And on the day that it shows up, a windstorm around my house lifts up a hundred-year-old tree and slams it into my home. Now, had my neighbors not been there with backhoes and, and equipment, they literally caught literally the tree off the house and saved it. But I also remembered that do not mock the box. <laughs> mm. That if you make fun of it, then then prepare for the consequences. So I actually do, for the most part, treat it very seriously. That it is not something to be made light of. And what about this big hole that happened on that the property? That was another thing. Um, so um, uh, after we were uh, had the Divic box and, and um, uh, was kind of investigating it and putting it inside an ark, so the, the rabbis basically said, look, you've got some, some bad energy. He got some bad mojo there. What you want to do is take the acacia wood. It's slow growing. It's a Middle Eastern wood. It's almost impenetrable. It's like lead. And this is what the Ark of the Covenant was acacia. Now, when the tree blooms, it's the most fragrant flower. And so this uh, temples and Ark of the Covenant, all of these are made out of acacia. So the rabbis say, you need a tree of acacia. You need to carve it 
lined it in gold, put the Dybbuk box in this arc, and it will numb it down a little bit. So soon after we did this, it's kind of like the Dybbuk's Revenge, literally a hole opened up in our yard, and um, uh, a family member nearly fell to their death. Um, no explanation. It just uh, uh, opened up and, and discovered it in the morning. Um, it had not been there um, in the evening uh, as we were doing chores, and sometime between the evening and morning, it, it had opened up, and family taking things out to the field and stuff uh, had nearly fallen into the hole. So, uh, again, one of those things, do not mock or, or threaten the divot box. It did not like being put in that arc. Even to this day, when you bring out the um, divot box out of its arc, it releases this scent. Um, it always had a weird scent of cat piss and flowers. But now, in the arc, it has this woody scent, almost an addictive smell, that it wants you to open it up. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, even now, I'd love to smell it. Um, but I kind of like any, any other addiction, it's like I just kind of put it out of my mind. <laughs> now, did you, you put it in a cave, didn't you? Um, basically, I, I moved it um, under my house because we have a, a, a finished cellar. Uh, my house is over 100 years old. It's an old Victorian with a tower and stuff. I had actually moved it to the crawl space and dug out the ground, and it was in um, a case, a, a military case. So it, the divot box is in a, a gold-lined arc of acacia in a military case that I could then put in the ground. Supposedly the rabbi said that it'll draw the negative energy out and really pretty much forgot about it until um, I did the show for Zach Bagans. And Zach begged me, and he'd never been out in, in um, gee, um, probably 10 years. It had never, since it arrived, it had never gone anywhere. And it's like, please, please, please bring it to Las Vegas to my haunted museum, which he had not opened yet, but he was doing this deadly possession show. And he had Robert the doll and Annabelle and all kinds of things he was bringing to the museum. Interestingly, I think he acquired many of those items. Dr. Kevorkian's van for, you know, basically um, assisted suicide. Uh, Michael Jackson's chair that he got injected in for um, going to sleep, which ultimately was um, his death. And so um, he's like, please, please, please bring this thing to me and we'll tape a show in my haunted museum. And we did. And it was things happened and things were weird. And it was a very successful show. And I boxed it all back up, took it back home and buried it back to where it was. And that's when Zach started texting, emailing, mm -hmm. you know, I really, he goes, my museum is opening soon, and this would be the centerpiece. I would tell the story, I'd tell the real story, the Hollywood story, I'd dedicate two full rooms to it, I will do it right, I'll have designers that have done Star Wars, uh, design it, um, just give me a chance to have it, it's like, nah, 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 you know, <laughs> uh. <laughs> leave me alone. <laughs> but, <laughs> But the more I kept thinking daily, uh, people wanting access and stuff. And when I was at his museum, I have to be honest, Zach's stuff is the real thing. If he has voodoo uh, kits, it's the real. I mean, because I'm a museum person. He truly had the real old stuff. His Ouija boards were the earliest and perfect. He truly has collected his whole life the biggest collection of, of the best paranormal and I thought if I were going to give the Divic box this would be the best place and it would let people have access now we discussed you need to have a waiver Some, they can't be under the age of 18 they need to be legal adults and Zach has followed through on everything he said that would happen um, and he's done it right so I don't know many how many hundreds a day go through and get access to see many other things but for the most part, they all want to see the divot box. Does any has Zach told you about any uh, uh, given you any stories about 
anything possibly that's going on in the museum because of the box? Any strange things? Any bad? Any bad? Um, <laughs> negative? He, he does say that constantly there are things going on around or anything relating to the Dybbuk box, plus people who visit it uh, passing out, uh, incapacitated, losing their energy. So I know that people who get near it really have um, almost everybody feels creepy. And then there's even a large percentage of people that actually have a negative effect um, from being in the room with it and tri truly need to get out as soon as possible. So um, I, I guess the good thing is you wanted access, you've got access. But he says there's all kinds of energy. And more recently, um, you know, I'm not the biggest um, uh, music guy. I listen to what's on the radio. But there's this uh, white rapper named Post Malone. And, you know, when you're a celebrity like Zach Bagans, you hang around with people like Post Malone, who's probably one of the best-known um, music artists right now. Uh, all the kids know who Post Malone is. And so, you know, Zach and he are having a beer. And, uh, of course, Zach is like, you want to see my most amazing artifact? And Post is like, sure. And so they go into the Dybbuk box uh, room. And Post gets a really bad feeling. And Zach is, you know, feeling no pain. Um, opening up uh, the glass container and kind of touching the divic box and, 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 and Post will have no more of it. He grabs him, but he creates a connection of he through uh, Zach to the divic box, uh, an electrical connection, touch, touch, touch. And he says, I instantly felt something negative, kind of like the original woman who felt an energy that she couldn't explain. And then over the next period of week, I think his car was wrecked twice, his plane lost its tires and he was nearly killed um, landing. He uh, had robbers come and attack where he was living to try to do him harm. And Post Malone said, you know, all those incidences in one week and I've had nothing going on, I'm not going to mess with the Dybbuk box anymore. So you can pretty much just um, Google Post Malone Dybbuk and uh, you can see those stories. It made international news because everybody's worried about Post Malone. So um, all I'm saying is things continue to happen with the Dybbuk box. And so it is permanent. Is this permanently then with Zach Bagans? So here's the thing. As I mentioned, every buyer from the first antique dealer, Kevin Manis, um, to the college student, to myself, there is a degree of you willingly buy the item and the curse. So when Zach begged me for years, years, <laughs> And I finally thought, you know what, um, I, I feel bad that people want access and they can't have access, um, so I am going to turn it over to Zach. So, but I told Zach, I said, it's not just the Dybbuk box, you get nine years of research, all the scripts, all my books, all the Hollywood aspect, all the costumes, everything that goes with it, and you get all of my, you know, nine linear feet of studying Jewish mysticism. I said. You get it all. I actually had, um, I don't know, maybe 19 variations of the Dybbuk box because it truly is a wine cabinet. So you can go out and still find these. And so I had acquired all these things. Um, there was an exact replica. Sam Raimi for the movie would never have the real thing. So he paid um, about $4,000 through royalties to create an exact copy. So Zach has an exact copy and the real thing. The challenge with a copy is like is like like. So if you create something exactly, it has the potential of the original. And if the two touch and uh, artifacts interchange as they did, then you have contaminant magic. So um, to me, the replica is just as um, significant and dangerous as the real thing. So Zach got it all. Now, Zach was willing just to take it um, and borrow it. But my thought would be, if I give it to him, but I still retain um, the connection, this isn't good for me. Just like this Post Malone stuff. How do I know what he's going to do? And that may have a negative effect on me. So the idea was, Zach, you must purchase it at a nominal fee. Mostly, he was buying the research. Um, to, to set it up, but it's like, no, you just have to purchase it. Um, when you think of, uh, and, and to me, it's not about making money. 
So if he sells tickets and people see it, good for him, but I don't want to be involved in that. You know. So if they make a sequel, you'll have nothing to do with it? No, I actually would because um, um, due to our contract, any sequels, any television shows, um, I continue to get royalties and I act as a consultant. Just because I don't have it doesn't mean I don't understand it or have all the knowledge about it. So I would still be very active, probably as a consultant. And um, anything that goes with the Divic Box continues to um, pay royalties, which, again, just this um, January, we sent 25 doctors back to the orphanage um, to help out these kids. Mm -hmm. So to me, as long as you can do good things, um, it's cool. Yeah, it's awesome. So what did he, what did Zach do with the replica? I don't know. (laughs) I mean, I know he has it. I don't know if it's somewhere where people can see it. Um, My intent was that people could have a more intimate relationship with uh, the duplicate and then give some distance. And he does. He keeps it over sage and basil and sea salt, which was my recommendation. So literally it floats over these um, very basic um, um, cleansing materials. And I myself felt that basil, sea salt, and sage had a very protective element when the Divic box was in my care. So he's put those underneath it, and it kind of levitates over them. Um, But I don't know what he's he's done with all, I mean, I've never gone to Las Vegas to see how he sets it up. I guess if I did, I would visit with Zach, and we'd have a, a, a delightful talk. Um, we, we certainly are on good terms, and um, whenever something comes up um, that I'm aware of, I usually give them a heads up, like the entertainment um, cable show or the Divic Box um, in India. All these things that he may not be aware of, I'm constantly making sure that he knows what's going on since he is now the caretaker. Mm-hmm. So has anything changed for you? since you no longer have that in your possession, the Dibbit box? I would say that um, I mean, I'm certainly uh, in a positive way more spiritual, but no, I don't feel I carry the burden of it, which I think is kind of nice. Um, I don't think about it. I don't worry about it. I don't wonder what will happen to it if, if I'm gone. All those are no longer my worries. Um, if Zach ever feels a need to get rid of it, he knows how to. He has to sell it. He doesn't have to, he can sell it for a dollar, but somebody has to willingly accept it from him, knowing its history. And this day and age, as one of the, if not the most haunted artifact, everybody knows the Divic Box Absolutely. worldwide. I just was, like I said, in Brazil last week doing lectures, and all of a sudden, all my friends in Brazil start sending me uh, the Possesseo. It's the Portuguese version of the possession, and they're all freaking out over it, um, you know. So uh, it, 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 um, it transcends all cultures and um, lands. Wow. We have a couple questions for you, Jason. Sure. Uh, from Susie Farrell. Question, which is worse, the Dibbit or the Ouija board? Uh, good question. Well, I see the Dibbit as a prayer box. Certainly there's an energy. Certainly there are spiritual aspects. But I do think that in this case, you have the opportunity to positively interact with it. Now, you could negatively, where I think that the Ouija board in general is just picking up random um, spirits, and you don't know their intent. You know, nowadays, with um, Internet the way it is, you know, people are constantly catfishing. They're pretending to be somebody they're not. I think of the Ouija as being catfished. You really don't know the intent of those spirits surrounding the Ouija. However, the Dybbuk box has been a consistent spirit, Uh, or energy, and so I do think that it's a known, and um, as long as you're truthful and and positive with it, things stay, I think, on that level. The Ouija, I think it's a Mm crapshoot. All right, from uh, Tess M., would someone ever find a box in error? If so, what would happen to them? You mean come across one by kind of mistake? Yeah. I think... um, like my family, I kept them kind of in the dark, so they didn't have the effects that I did understanding what it is. So I think knowledge kind of opens you up to, I think, um, access. I think if you just come across something and think it's weird um, and things start to maybe change, 
you can remove it from your life and go back to normal. It's when you're aware and involve yourself that you, you've tied yourself to the item. So I, I do think that in general, and, and, and by the way, the Divic box, though it's the only thing named that way, putting tokens inside a container and burying it in a cemetery for energy, this has been done since you know the Greek times. 2,000 years ago, you would take two bowls, throw all the hair and, 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 and spiritual pieces in, seal the bowl, the, the clay bowl, and bury it, hmm. and supposedly create an energy and, and a way of, of, of working with um, the um, spiritual world. So the concept of tokens and spirits being attracted is thousands of years old, but there is only one named the Dybbuk box. So you could just, by my knowledge right now telling you about it, create your own if you wanted to. I don't know if I'd recommend it. <laughs> All right, I, this you we talked about this already, but Misty Dawn wanted to know how you feel. If you feel any different now that you don't have the box in your custody, I really do feel somewhat of a relief. Um, I don't mind talking about it. I don't mind like this interview or working with entertainment um, cable channel. I mean, I, I the thing is, you cannot escape it. There's a French paranormal guy. He's huge in Montreal, and just today I got a. Uh, a message on Facebook saying, hey, did you give the Dybbuk box to this great paranormal psychic of Montreal? And I said, actually not. I gave him the granites, um, candlesticks, um, even brass cups, all similar things from the same time period, but he would have had a reproduction. But that said, like acts as like, so... He may have his own kind of form of a Dybbuk box, and to be honest, I don't know if it's giving him grief or not, but he does not have the real thing. That is without a doubt in um, Dr. Er, in Zach Bagan's um, haunted museum. All right. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, from Chippa Terry, uh, she says, I am going to Vegas in October. Chippy, so am I. Um, <laughs> and the museum. Uh, do you think it's safe to photo the box? We discussed this, Noreen. Yes. I don't know if Zach permits people to actually they don't. shoot images of the Dybbuk box. They, they um, don't. They don't allow any photography at all. Of, of anything in there. Yeah. But I do think it's legit stuff. And you do have to sign the waiver. And, you know, you're prepped and you go through the whole museum. I mean, it's, it's, it is, um, um, from what I understand, you might wait an hour, an hour and a half just to get in the building. And then the tour itself, might, I think, is up to an hour uh, or two, based on what I've read on reviews. So I would tell you, go online. You can look at Yelp or just type in uh, Haunted Museum Reviews because you will find what people are saying today and what's going on. I've done that just out of curiosity. And, um, you know, I'm, I, I am pleased that um, I've been able to give people access and, and, and even people who live in my same town, I almost fell over. They said, God, I went to uh, Las Vegas and I saw the Dybbuk box. And I said, well, I, I feel kind of bad because you've lived in our town forever. And uh, But it's true, I probably wouldn't have given you access. He goes, and, and I wanted to see it. So I went all the way to Vegas. So it's like, well, if that works for you. Um, but again, um, read the reviews. It'll tell you what's going on with people. Um, who actually witness and, and, and visit the Dybbuk box. Okay. And from Royce, um, our, Royce Hinman Armad, he, he wants to know, um, do you know what is really inside of the box or how it works? I've seen inside of the box and it's not nice. So let's, um, let's go back to the image of the box, what you said was in there. Uh, let me find it. Um, right. There's rare granites with um, okay. the words shalom, uh, which means peace, but a peace that might only be achieved in death. You know, it's not like peace and <laughs> live long and prosper peace. It's actually a state of being um, that might not be achieved. There is this 1890s um, peaking uh, uh, candlestick with octopus feet, the sea being very mysterious. Um, the company that created this burned to the ground. And so after 1910, you could not find any more of these peaking uh, candlesticks. There is the brass cup 
which um, uh, basically has traditionally used uh, in uh, Jewish um, ceremonies, uh, a Kaddish cup, as they call it. And usually alcohol enhances spiritual activity, so hence using um, the alcohol. Um, there are pennies, and again, uh, the dates are 
<laughs> Thank you, Jason. Good night. Thank okay, you. Good night. Good night. Oh, that was awesome. That was awesome. I was so nice to have him back. I've known Jason for seven years and um, really nice. Uh, anyway, so everybody, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for your questions. And uh, next week, I have Steve Deshavi from Dead Files. Uh, he's joining the show and he's going to talk about whatever the paranormal what happens on the show um some of the clients that they he's dealt with but it should be a good show so i hope you join us next week and i've already made the event on um on youtube so um please join us you can uh, hit a uh, set a reminder for yourself so uh thanks to the mods um royce hinman and cassandra i'm not sure if annie is here tonight but um, thank you so much. If it wasn't for our mods, you know, you wouldn't have the great chat room that we have. So let's do some shout outs. Oh, gosh, you know what? Hold on. Um, okay, let's. Oh, sorry, Tammy. I didn't see your. Um, I didn't see your question. I'm so sorry. Oh, gosh, I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Oh, gosh, Chippa Terry. Thanks, honey. Thank you so much for the uh, super chat money. Thank you so much. It's nice to be back on my channel. And I don't want to go into it, but there's a story why I couldn't be on my channel. But I'm really glad to, glad to be back. Um, let's see. All right, Royce, should I just go to, um, I'll just go to the channel, honey. I know. Um, let's see. Who do we have? Well, we have... Royce Hemin, we have um, Cassandra, our mods. Then we have Misty Dawn, Lori Miller, uh, Maria Sandra Amador, uh, Linda Kendrick, Nicole Johnson, B3 Airspace, The Haglin, The I Am Alpha, Dust Bunny, Tammy Heitzman. Gee, it's nice to see you guys. Carl White, there you are. You didn't forget me. Thanks, Carl. Um, Cindy W. Um, Charlotte Wise. Oh, okay. Okay, I'm gonna go to Royce. Royce sent me a a, a list. Aaron Brody, Andrew and his trekking gnomes. B3 Airspace, Cassandra Fifty, Chip Terry, Dust Bunny, Fairy Queen, I Am Alpha, Linda Kendrick, Lori Miller, Margarita Havorth, Maria H. Marvin Martin. Michael Kani, Michael, Misty Dawn, Nicole Johnson, Royce Hinman, Rufus Torrey, Starry Night, Steph Farah, Tammy Heitzman, Tess M, The Hagelin, and Yvonne Bissett. I uh, hope I didn't miss anybody. Did I miss anyone? Thank you so much, Cara, Cara Fuse, Sarah B. Hey, uh, Sarah Lowe. Hey, don't forget, um, give the show a like. And uh, don't forget to uh, subscribe to my channel. I'd, I'd appreciate it. So, uh, thanks so much. Next week should be another awesome show, Lori Miller. Um, and so I'll see you next Thursday. You can also sign up for show reminders on paranormalzone.tv. And there's a little tab to click on show reminders, and, and I'll send you an email. So, everybody, I'm going to go. Thanks so much for being here. And... Um, I really appreciate it. And so nice to see everybody. And I'm happy to be back. So everybody, I love you and thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Have a wonderful weekend. Good night. Thank you.